decided to put our money where put our mouth where our money our money where our mouth is. There we go, um, and actually make a game. Um, we had extra motivation to do so because one of my uh, colleagues created this beautiful game cabinet, which uh, had a much less complex game. But given um, all of the modern features that Cesium has created in the past couple of years, we decided to uh, kick things up a notch. And in collaboration with Venturi Labs, a uh, game incubator started out of the University of Pennsylvania, um, we decided to make a more modern game to showcase in this game cabinet. So one of the first things we decided is that um, for to showcase Cesium's features, um, a, drone, a drone racing game would be a nice complement to both the community and the feature set that we have. And so we decided to make a drone racing simulator. And um, another, another one of my colleagues, Ed Mackey, made this uh, beautiful Cesium drone model, model with a nice PBR shading uh, and a uh, 3D noise texture that he created and exported from uh, Substance Painter. So now that we had our uh, nice looking drone model, we of course needed a uh, 3D environment to match. So uh, in collaboration with uh, Bentley, we ended up using this photogrammetry model, this incredibly detailed photogrammetry model um, of, uh, of downtown Philadelphia. So I said game engine for the real world, and I think um, one place where Cesium really shines is of course uh, with our recent 3D tiles work. Um, it wouldn't ordinarily be possible to show off a model of this size, especially um, of this size, and not just to have it, but to fly through it at drone, at drone simulation speeds. So um, this is the environment that we ended up using. We had um, some procedurally generated routes. Um, I'd say that the next uh, big feature that we worked on was um, uh, using Cesium's camera API. We started off using a not particularly interesting uh, camera model on the left-hand side, and we realized that one thing that was really needed to convey um, the speed and to make the game fun was a more dynamic uh, camera model. So um, we got to play with our 3D camera API a little, and what we created was a, uh, a control system and a camera model that uh, didn't just stay a fixed distance away from the drone as you, as you flew through the game, but instead, um, would uh, would follow the drone at a uh, at a different velocity depending on how far away you are, adding a little more dynamicism, making uh, making this or making the flight feel um, definitely a lot more uh, interactive. We also got to play with um, some other fun visualization features from Cesium, including um, screen space shading. Uh, we have a silhouette effect here when you crash into a drone. Uh, not depicted here, unfortunately, but future work for this game. We recently added um, particle systems, and so we're hoping that um, in future iterations of this game, we'll be able to have some fun explosions if you die in a spectacular way. Putting this all together, we ended up with what I'm happy to say was uh, quite a fun game uh, that we implemented and ported to that arcade cabinet. Unfortunately, not at SIGGRAPH, but uh, we carry it with us to um, several different conferences. If you're going to be joining us at FOS4G, we should have the arcade cabinet there for you to play. Overall, the project was a lot of fun and uh, got to showcase a lot, of, a lot of Cesium features, and I think what really distinguishes it from a traditional um, map visualization API, we really do um, have a lot of game engine features that are really pushing the field forward. All right, that's it. I'm going to pass you guys back to Patrick. That's awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I really loved. The, I really loved the game. I think they did a great job with it. Uh, so I'd like to wrap up with a, a few of the things that are that are in the pipeline for Cesium. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work in in screen space, so we have a nice lens flare coming. Lens flare is interesting because a lot of people try to in the real world they try to avoid that, but in computer graphics we're trying to add it back. Um, and then building on the screen space stuff, uh, we're doing ambient occlusion. So here's a, a BIM model, building information modeling. We're seeing a lot of people combining geospatial and BIM together in cesium. Uh, so here's just the plain model. Here it is with ambient occlusion, right? So if you look in the top left where the, the water heater is, you can see a lot more detail once the AO comes in. Uh, and even on the far right with the, uh, with the stairs, same deal. And here's just the AO. And then the screen space is really good for these massive models, right, because it's independent of scene complexity. So it's all just running per fragment instead of per, per vertex. 
Uh, here's something I'm super pumped on, right? So this is a point cloud, okay? And then this is screen space filling of that point cloud, region growing. I can't tell you how many times I went back and forth when I was making the, these slides, probably hundreds. Um, here's another example. So this is we're inside a, a church. Uh, you can kind of see that, that painting. Here it really comes in with the region growing. You'll see that purple comes through though, and, and we believe that that purple is on the, is on the other side of, of the wall, and the inside of the wall closer to us is a little undersampled. That's why you get that kind of artifact. Uh, here's another example where we're doing region grown plus AO. You can kind of make out some of the statues here. Add them in, you really get a ton, ton more detail. So super lightweight, there's really no pre-processing. Just turn on the filters. Again, here's colored point clouds. Here's region growing plus the AO. You can see along the windows in the bottom, you get a lot more detail. And then add back the color. So really cool ways to explore your data and know more about the surface, right? The point cloud is a representation of that surface. Um, along the 3D tiles work that we've been doing, the, the spatial data structure for streaming the massive models, we're starting a, a next generation version of that to, to add some, some new and pretty exciting features here. Um, so we've been doing the photogrammetry models that I mentioned, but there's also a lot of people doing vector data, and we really want to combine that vector data that has semantics uh, with the photogrammetry models. And there's very traditional kind of 2D point line polygon draped over terrain that's very classic in the mapping world. Uh, but with our vector tiles, we're really bringing it into full 3D. So you can see in the bottom right, we have representative um, floors in a building. And then in the top right here, we've highlighted just individual parts of the tree. So it can do underhangs, complete complex uh, geometry. Um, one thing that when we haven't started this yet, but we're, that's why it's next, uh, that we're super excited on is time dynamics. So now, you know, it's just, it's becoming so easy, for example, to fly your drone every day over the same area. Maybe it's a construction site, and then you want to know, well, how's the construction project going and what's changing over time? So we're looking at doing basically massive model meets interactive streaming video, right? I think it's a super hard, uh, super hard problem in multiple dimensions. So we're looking forward to working on it. Uh, likewise, we're adding some analytics that are, you know, inspired from the graphics world. Uh, with a declarative language, you could very concisely say, for example, is this building in shadow or not in shadow? Um, from this particular view, is this truck visible or invisible, or is it partially visible? Um, and in the far right here, that drone example is saying, I want to shade this photogrammetry model uh, based on the distance uh, to that drone model. So it starts adding, you know, some analytic capabilities driven by uh, driven by the graphics. Uh, also, as these models get bigger and bigger, and even just the individual assets like that truck model I showed you with the GLTF, but once you start adding in all those textures, I mean, the model gets pretty pretty heavy, uh, so we're excited that the Google Draco has a nice mesh and point cloud compression. They're actually going to be presenting at the GLTF BOF on Wednesday. Uh, really fast, it decodes, it's compressed much better than GZIP, decodes really quickly, and they have open source encoders and decoders. So we're looking forward to integrating those. Um, and then if you're interested in more about cesium, Rachel and I will be here. We're happy to answer any questions. We also have a cesium BOF uh, tomorrow, and then we'll be at the GLTF BOF uh, on Wednesday, as well as the Kronos Party Wednesday night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for having us. You're welcome. Thank you. So these guys are going to hit the circuit so you can find them again, right? Yeah, they you say, you say. I'm not going to pull my slides up. I'm just going to bring you on up. I think, just, I think it's a little too complicated to switch around. Nicholas is going to introduce the Web3D Consortium and your work, right? Are we going to make? Thank you. Aren't these guys with cesium great? Really great. Yeah. You get it? What do we got to do? I'm just going to do Thank you, buddy. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming, uh, ladies and gentlemen. 
My name is Nicholas Paulus. Um, I'm actually a faculty member at Virginia Tech, and I'm here today um, to present some of the work coming out of the Web3D Consortium. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the Web3D Consortium, we have been a not-for-profit organization uh, for almost 20 years, and running also some of you may have heard of the Web3D Conference, which is an ACM small conference, also now in its 22nd year. But essentially, we're a member-driven organization. We work with all sorts of stakeholders who are interested in the 3D web, publishing their content in different ways, right? And when the web is the platform and the interface, you really are concerned about uh, being able to run on lots of different platforms and devices. And another thing is that you're typically pulling in assets from all sorts of different uh, web servers and different resources, right? So to be able to collect all of those and describe the way to present those uh, different kinds of data, uh, we have the extensible 3D standard. So X3D, as it's known, is a, an ISO ratified standard. It's openly published. And it's basically um, uh, the successor to VRML. If you've seen declarative style scene graph um, with JavaScript type of programming and an API, the extensible 3D standard has evolved and continues to evolve really because of the community and the members. So when we come up with hard problems, we work together and we figure out what's the best technical solution. We implement that in two different, at least two different uh, implementations before uh, we standardize it. And then it goes through and is reviewed by all the national bodies uh, around the world. So it's, uh, we've had lots of lots of eyes and, um, and hearts in, in the development of this specification. And uh, I hope that you will um, enjoy what you see and also come to learn more with our booth, um, in our booth, which is booth 306. OK, so uh, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to show a few applications that are coming out of Virginia Tech. And these are all X3D based. Um, it'll continue kind of the theme that we saw today about um, repurposing some content, maybe for a new application. Uh, so I'm going to present quickly two of, uh, two of those projects, and then I'll ask Mike Rusalisi to uh, give a demo of some of the work he's been doing uh, with the Navy and Synergy Software, one of our members. Okay. So the first thing I'd like to show, actually, is uh, 3D Blacksburg. So we'll put this into uh, full screen here. Hopefully you can see it. Blacksburg, yes. Blacksburg, Virginia, uh, down in the southwest of Virginia in the Appalachian Mountains, um, home of Virginia Tech. And you can see the campus and the, and the town here. Uh, what we've done is use the 3D Blacksburg model for a lot of different applications and use cases. So from things like, um, you know, bringing in some SketchUp models and saying, what will the downtown uh, revitalization look like, right? Maybe we want to uh, turn on or off different kinds of layers, right, to show the possible, uh, possible designs. And I'm flying through here with a game pad because when we had started 3D Blacksburg, right, we were uh, really using it for these kinds of design review applications. But because we have the model of the town, we've been able to actually uh, repurpose this for a number of different applications. The one I'm showing you here is we have a, it's a, actually a frog hunting game, okay? So it's in the theme of, of gamifying our, our geospatial 3D data. But there's a creek that runs through Blacksburg and it's really underground for most of uh, its passage through town. And so even though we have 27,000 students, who walk across our quad every day, they don't realize that there's a uh, creek going underneath there. So Struble's Creek, it's listed as impaired. And we're doing a lot of work with the community to revitalize it and raise awareness. So one of the things we did at the Virginia Science Festival was made this game so that we could have hundreds of students come and, uh, and learn about the creek. We did perform a user study. Um, which is in the Web3D proceedings of this year, basically that uh, the, the users who had played this game condition, uh, which was the study was run with college students, 
uh, were more motivated to uh, seek out more information about the creek, they also were able to draw its uh, path much more accurately. So just by following the creek and finding the frogs along there, they've been actually able to uh, acquire a lot of spatial knowledge. Okay, so 3D Blacksburg. Um, the other thing I think that has been kind of fun has been working with uh, the WebGL type of platform. So, you know, X3D uh, can be run with JavaScript in the browser. And what I'm showing here is the X3DOM toolkit. Um, we have a sustainability center a little bit ways up from the campus. And some of the things that we use, I'm going to skip the training, but I wanted to sort of show some of the detail. Excuse me. Of this model. Excuse me. There we go. Good. Um, <clears throat> we took terrain and imagery, obviously from uh, from the standard geospatial tools. Used some of our Python scripts to uh, convert that into georeferenced X3D. Uh, a few SketchUp buildings are brought in here. But the thing I think that I wanted to um, really highlight about this model is the fact that the tree LOD models um, are actually all located based on LiDAR points, right? So we actually took the real terrain and then the laser scan data to place the, um, the tree models. And this has been useful We're also being able to run things like the forest vegetation simulator. What's the, the planting going to be like? Uh, in 10 years, 20 years. So integrating with the web is one of the, the really exciting parts of X3D and um, being able to pull data and kind of glue it together, give you some interactive presentation um, is very exciting. And uh, within the Web3D consortium, we have a geospatial working group. And uh, Mike, who I'm going to invite up next, is uh, often involved in those meetings as well. Uh, we would invite you to join as we continue to develop the X3D specification. Some of the things that we'll see, of course, is being able to use uh, GLTF as an asset payload. This is a great, great news. And uh, looking forward to the tile work too. I think that's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be excellent. So please join us and I'm gonna invite uh, Mike up to show some of the work that he's been doing with geospatial and X3D. Thanks. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Russellacy. I am the co-founder of Synergy Software Design. Uh, we've been working with the Navy for uh, going on 14 years now. Um, started out in really boring um, database web-based applications for them. And um, it turned into some pretty cool 3D stuff that we've done. Um, just a background on us. You know, we've been around for about 13 years, uh, led by myself and Tom Cowan. Uh, we're back in DC, um, and we've been uh, working with NAFAC here for um, developing uh, 3D planning um, with just the web browser. We didn't start out to do this, but we're now in the motivation to disrupt conventional planning. Um, everyone who's here is pretty familiar with 3D, but I would venture to say that if you tried to talk about 3D planning with anyone else outside of the people who are here, they would have no idea what you're talking about. So uh, what we're doing right now is we're helping uh, the Navy actually understand what 3D planning is and how we can very easily transition the 2D information into 3D to make better choices, better decisions, and reduce a lot of risk. First thing that we generally do is identify digital doubles. So that's kind of the, the uh, one of the big buzzwords recently. Um, it works for infrastructure, it works for bases, it works for platforms, it works for support models. Uh, one of the things that we do that uh, brings it more uh, specific to these users is to talk about component data 
within an object within a geospatial realm. Um, uh, the second part is to simulate uh, the models of platforms like a ship or a boat uh, near infrastructure. So we've got you know waterfront piers and bridges and buildings and all fun stuff like that. Uh, we collaborate then with uh, whiteboards. So uh, with the whiteboards, it allows us to identify areas that are of interest that need to be looked at more, and this is where that 3D planning goes from 2D to 3D pretty quick. What we found is that we were able to find the problem very early. Uh, we found that problems that were where uh, we completely moved the need to uh, make brand new tugboats. The tugboats were going to cost us all $900 million. So uh, just able to identify that things can be fixed early on in the process, save lots of money, reduce risk. That's it for the presentation. I'll go right now. What we do is uh, we data that the Navy has access, that, that we have access to, and that's topography, uh, LIDAR, and bathymetry. We combine from uh, AutoCAD, from it doesn't really matter. We distill them all down into X3D. X3D is the backbone for all of this application. It allows us to take models from Lockheed Martin, from um, uh, General Dynamics, and also from the different uh, architecture and engineering firms who develop the uh, waterfront structures and the buildings. And we're able to look at all these things in the same common picture. By us being able to look at it in the same common picture, it gives uh, all of the stakeholders the ability to make decisions pretty quickly. What we've done here in 3D, though, is created a situation that allows us to have this item up on screen where 30 or 40 people can be around at the same time and really just kind of barking out orders. I think you uh, might have been in the situation where uh, something that's very compelling in 3D has the uh, uh, situation where someone says, oh, um, can, you just, can you just kind of show me the back of the sub? And then we say, sure, absolutely. Um, from that, they say, oh, you know what, how about we take a look at it from the top? If we can see from the top, that'd be really helpful. Um, what if we see from the back right? What we end up learning is that it's not necessarily a, a, a fine end user application that needs to happen. What we are here and we're supporting is decision making and identifying problems as easily and as simply as possible. So what, in this situation, we're able to then go through and identify very simply um, items of length, just very simply doing this. And again, we're not doing the most crazy 3D stuff. We're not doing things like I really want to be doing with the cesium stuff with lens flares and flying drones around. All that we're really doing is making sure that we're asking the right questions so that the next level of um, work is done properly. Um, and what you're seeing here is also the identification of 3D whiteboards. And uh, this allows us to do very simple items, saying, oh, that's very important to me. And we're able to then uh, get this picture into effectively a PowerPoint that goes right up to the chief, who then says, I'm going to make a decision off of this. What we do is to help make decisions faster and better. Um, we do it in 3D because most of the time in 3D, we're presented a problem that can't be solved in 2D. In the 2D world, we look at plan view. Plan view works really well for planning cities, but it doesn't work very well for planning uh, the interaction of two completely three-dimensional objects. What's interesting about this whole thing is that while we are doing this, and it's fairly rudimentary because we're trying to keep it very simple, um, there is nothing else like it from the DoD side with in terms of planning and how it works out with all of the different platforms, all of the different people involved, and how we can help make decisions off of it. And what we're trying to do is get more people to recognize that 3D planning itself is important. Uh, the entire community of 3D planning, from Esri folks, Cesium, X3D Geospatial, 
we can all work together in this because the more people who know 3D planning, the better we're all, all going to be. Um, we all have our in individual little niches. Well, mine's little, but uh, um, everyone else has their niches. And what we want to do is make sure that if we do anything with Esri, I want to make sure that the X3D stuff works with it. If CEZM does everything with the GLTF, I want to make sure that we can work with it too. What Nicholas didn't tell you was the fact that I'm also the vice president of the Web3D Consortium. So I am here with him to make sure that X3D by itself as a file format is actually something that you guys are also very aware of and how well it works in geospatial. With that, I'm going to switch over to an announcement. Um, as of about 30 minutes ago, we just published our first Chrome extension for X3D. Uh, you guys can just search for it. It's uh, SEO trending on X3D for Chrome browser because it's literally the only thing for X3D on Chrome browser right now. And uh, what it allows us to do is very simply open up X3D files from your desktop um, and view them in the browser without having to upload them anywhere first, without having to change any code, just make it really, really, really easy. Um, what we found is that um, during our workflow, we have to look at X3D files as many times as we can, and uh, we don't look at them in, in separate viewers. We can't do that because the target is x 3 uh, So at this point, we needed to build a plugin. So uh, we just published this out because we've been doing it. We really needed to have something to do it, and it's pretty cool. Um, works with everything. So uh, with that, I'm going to throw it back to Nicholas for a quick closing on X3D. Um, but yeah, if you guys want to, Chrome Web Store, X3D, it is the first thing comes up here. Uh, and this is one of those situations. It was created by one of our interns. So that's pretty fun. Um, uh, it's fun when they have nothing to do and we tell them to do <laughs> make a web plugin. Uh, so with that, um, I don't think that there's anything else to close. You want to do anything? I'll identify one, two, two things, X3D, X3D, three things. Uh, we're looking for uh, partners. We're looking for projects. We're looking to expand um, how well X3D has worked into it. And uh, with that, I'll pass it over to uh, Tam. So we have ESRI presenting right now. You know, these guys said that they're, they're, they really do collaborate. It's really true. I mean, I've worked with them for a number of years, and all of them know each other. As we were, as we were putting this presentation together, everybody was laughing and crossing with each other and discussing. So what they're really saying is really true. They all really do collaborate and share with each other within their limits. I mean, I realize that there are limitations here, but um, there really is a pretty good um, respect among each other. How's that? Yes, definitely. Thank you again. All right, let me go back to the beginning right here. Actually, sorry. And, and then now back to the beginning. All right. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Tamra Balina. I'm a software developer within the Esri 3D team. Uh, we're here uh, among many of our colleagues to present uh, Esri solution for 3D JS across the platform. So Esri has been working on, uh, on bringing 3D uh, GIS to the masses for many years, and we have a solution that actually allows you to create content, manage, and stream it over to the web. So the video that you just saw playing now is created with ArcGIS Pro, which is Esri's premier solution for creating content and managing uh, 3D asset. And uh, we have many tools uh, that are available uh, for online as well as desktop usage. So the experience of GIS is changing. Uh, uh, the future GIS is mobile, is immersive, is uh, visually compelling, and also needs to be deep and smart, and that smart mapping is key and center when we talk about uh, 3D GIS. 
It also needs to be scalable and distributed. Uh, today, you need to be able to publish uh, gigabytes and terabytes of data to online and be able to consume that again back in mobile devices, uh, online or desktop uh, applications as well. So the thing that ties it all together is 3D as far as uh, uh, visualization and analytics is concerned. And we're very uh, uh, happy and excited about the future of uh, 3D GIS and I want to share with you here what we've been doing uh, in the past few years. So as I said first, uh, you can create and manage 3D content within the ESRI uh, suite of uh, software that we have. Uh, you can uh, generate uh, point cloud data or manage point cloud data, uh, 3D meshes, uh, your classic 3D objects as well as 3D vector data. Uh, we have a huge ecosystem of uh, online uh, environment where you can actually publish and consume content. The Living Atlas Elevation and Imagery is very popular among our users and uh, users in general that it is a place where you can actually get good base maps that you can actually supplement your uh, online application and desktop. Um, of course, uh, the back end does not get uh, a whole lot of uh, credit all the time, but the back end is equally important. Uh, there needs to be an ecosystem where you can actually publish your content and consume it directly by going to either ArcGIS Online or on your own premise on uh, cloud infrastructures are abundant nowadays and people and organizations all want to use their own infrastructure uh, uh, for managing content and uh, uh, dis dissemination of 3D data. Uh, as Marissa also said, we've been very active in the, uh, in the community, in the standards community. Uh, we just submitted uh, last fall I3S, uh, our technology index 3D scene layers uh, specification as an OGC community standard and we're uh, under consideration for final uh, approval right now as we speak. So we've been trying to contribute back to the community the things that we've been working at ASRI in a form of a standard and a specification for uh, folks to use. Um, of course, it's not only just desktop and uh, mobile application or, uh, or uh, online experience, but also we provide a uh, custom application uh, from custom JavaScript API to uh, native apps that uh, users and, uh, and developers can take that and actually have their own users. So the future of GIS, the future of 3D in GIS is, uh, is very bright. Uh, we're uh, spending a lot of energy and money in BIM and GIS integration, uh, uh, 3D editing, uh, improving visual effects, uh, mobile 3D is also very big and coming, uh, as well as uh, uh, AR and MR and uh, virtual reality are all uh, center place in 3D GIS. But the one that always brings, brings it back home is desktop. That's where a lot of people uh, start their content creation management. So as far as desktop systems go, we have uh, uh, at least two tools, two products that are front and center. ArcGIS Pro, the one that I mentioned earlier that did the animation, and uh, City Engine, Israel City Engine are two desktop applications that uh, offer uh, both powerful 2D and 3D uh, authoring environment and uh, data management. Uh, ArcGIS Pro is, uh, uh, is capable of uh, streaming 3D content as well as doing uh, spatial analysis and feature extraction as well as editing. Uh, whereas uh, City Engine is uh, really uh, geared towards interactive design and modeling tools as well as procedurally uh, generating uh, content. Um, we have a big presence here. Uh, we have a booth, uh, 1215, that actually will be showcasing uh, City Engine and City Engine 2017. Uh, what new offerings we have, and we really invite you to come out and uh, check it out. So, with City Engine, uh, procedural creation, as I said, and rule based uh, procedural creation is uh, uh, front and center, uh, but also you can also uh, create and design models uh, based on context queries that the model that you created is uh, within a certain given context, uh, as well as being able to do custom editing. For example, you can create a building and, uh, and modify the rules uh, that are related to that building and be able to replicate that along, uh, throughout your uh, city. Um, so all these tools are being showcased at the uh, booth uh, uh, here at SIGRA. So you, you see here in this video that uh, a particular window is being selected and uh, being resized and uh, immediately actually a new layer uh, of floor was added uh, uh, to the view the previous frames. And this is all possible, uh, doing this is all possible because the whole idea here is uh, procedurally modeling and uh, uh, editing. 
Um, of course, uh, interactive assessment or uh, quantifying the visual view or the, the view that you see is also important with our users. So we have tools that allow you to do uh, quantification of the, the visual content that you see in your screen. Uh, one quick announcement that I would like to make is uh, today uh, the uh, Unreal uh, Epic uh, event. We're making an announcement that City Engine 2017.1 is going gonna, is gonna to support direct exporting to Unreal. Uh, this is in addition to uh, City Engine 2017, which is capable of exporting out to FBX, but now we will not have the limitation of uh, uh, being constrained by FBX, but you can directly uh, export out to uh, the city uh, directly export out to Unreal uh, Epic uh, uh, APIs. So, um, just to wrap it up here, as far as the slides go, uh, we have numerous offering as far as uh, desktop goes and online, as well as uh, web uh, creation of content management on the web as well. Uh, ArcGIS Earth is one product that we have that allows you a freely available, uh, freely downloadable application that allows you to explore 3D data. Most of our enterprise users use it as sort of like a replacement to Google Earth in a way uh, to visualize their 3D uh, uh, content. Um, I mentioned earlier here that the back end kind of gotten, uh, gets forgotten, but the back end is equally important. Uh, the back end meaning here the enterprise or online cloud infrastructure where you would be able to publish content, manage content, and consume it directly throughout the platform. So uh, users normally want to be able to publish their content once and be able to consume it in mobile, desktop, and, and uh, online uh, application as well. Um, standards, uh, I3S, as I mentioned earlier, one thing to mention here is under consideration uh, for OGC uh, community standard approval. Uh, along with uh, 3D tiles, uh, we collaborate in the community and work into improving uh, the whole uh, GIS and 3D visualization system, both for online and uh, offline usage. Um, the last slide here I have is uh, some research that we're doing in VR, AR, and MR space, uh, being able uh, to overlay 3D content onto your uh, uh, VR and MR views, is, uh, uh, AR views are uh, pretty uh, important. Uh, for example, here in this video, uh, one of our developers is showcasing that you know your traditional route maps in GIS that you would be able to show from one point to another uh, point. Uh, routing systems could be displayed also in AR uh, views. This is uh, using a Tango phone and being able to actually find an employee within the uh, Esri compass and being able to locate it and navigate to that employee. See now that the uh, AR application already outlined the path to the employee, and you should be able to follow that uh, overlay in the AR view. I think the next view he turns around and uh, goes to a uh, different level, different stairs. And uh, with the Tango phone, it's actually very uh, easy to use because it has very uh, enhanced uh, sensing capabilities where you don't have GIS, uh, GPS coverage within buildings. So, um, let me actually quickly uh, bring up some live demos and show you what I've been talking about. Um, here, the first thing that you see here is uh, uh, the Orlando LiDAR in integrated mesh data demo that we have. So this is not a static map. This is actually a live uh, 3D map hitting the RHS online system. Uh, and uh, as you see here, there are different slides here that allow you to actually navigate between different views and be able to consume it. This is uh, one of the data types that we support in I3S called integrated mesh that has, uh, we call it kind of uh, a skin of the ground uh, type of layer that covers both building, vegetation, and uh, uh, 3D objects. Uh, but also, uh, you see here, uh, there's also uh, point cloud data being streamed live uh, uh, to this um, web browser application that I have. Um, moving on, uh, here is another example of uh, New York, uh, 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 the boroughs of New York covered by LiDAR data set. Uh, this data set covers about 4 billion points and also 3D objects. Uh, if I switch back to some of the slides here. Uh, and also uh, about a million uh, buildings uh, covering the entire uh, boroughs of uh, New York. And, um, you know, performance is pretty decent and pretty good. Uh, and this is, I'm just going over the Wi-Fi connection here with the uh, uh, conference, and uh, this is what people want to do, uh, be able to stream, uh, consume, and author this content uh, online as well as on desktop systems. Um, but 
uh, remember this is also GIS that you know every feature needs to be identifiable every feature needs to be uh, uh, connected to some database and be able to be mapped so uh, what we're really uh, uh, working on uh, and making sure is that not, sac not, not, not being able to not to have to sacrifice the uh, uh, database functionalities, the GIS functionalities that comes with it, but also be able to visualize uh, the system in very uh, uh, dynamic and interactive ways. So, over 1 million buildings and uh, 4 billion point cloud data uh, being streamed uh, to here. Um, here is an example of uh, done by our Zurich R&D lab, uh, an example that shows uh, that you can use our uh, ArcGIS API for JavaScript uh, 4.4 to be able to create actually custom application. For example, this application shows, uh, again, the uh, building coverage in New York, uh, but then additional information is being added. Not only the content is being streamed, but actually you can actually uh, look at some Wikipedia information associated with this or also bring some uh, uh, texture information. But not only that, you can also actually uh, tie it up with some data. For example, here there's a graph at the bottom that you can say, I only want to see buildings that are, uh, if I can uh, drag it up, that are over 500 feet. And the application uh, you know, obliges and uh, shows you the buildings that are over 500 feet. And maybe you can say pre-war, so you can turn all this, uh, the other buildings that are there. So this is, you know, interactive 3D mapping as well as being able to visualize and stream large amounts of data. Um, you can put it back to the original version where all the buildings will be shown. Um, yet another example that I have here uh, in the GIS field uh, or in, in urban planning, there's a, a usually a need to see uh, the usage, building usage data. Uh, here uh, you see buildings represented by their usage and colorized by their uh, uh, type of usage that they, they are being used. Uh, you can also do similarly here either by floor uh, or by a particular uh, uh, usage also could be displayed. Again, using the JavaScript API provided uh, uh, there. Um, another map here, I think I zoomed out again. Uh, all these maps are, you know, um, being streamed from ArcGIS Online and uh, they are at interactive speed and uh, rendering uh, quite good. Uh, one example that I want to show you here is that the uh, uh, style gallery that we ship with ArcGIS online and also on desktop. So the objects that you see here, the cars and the trees, are uh, as part of a style gallery that we provide with the ArcGIS online system that you can actually embed and include within your system for free uh, and be able to share that. And of course you can bring your own, uh, your own models to represent your 3D scene and be able to share it. Um, Moving on, uh, last but not least, uh, one of the things that I want to showcase is uh, uh, dynamic styling or being able to actually change the stylization of your map dynamically. So for a minute, assume that you are tasked with uh, you know, designing. This is city of San Francisco with about 100,000 uh, uh, texture buildings. And also there's a plan, if, if, I, if I switch here, uh, there, there are two transit lines. Uh, one, a future transit line, uh, actually here, walkability future, that shows. Um, and then, uh, um, actually, sorry, uh, there are two transit lines in here, uh, uh, proposed or planned and existing transit lines. And the task at hand is to actually create a map that shows the walkability of your city. And here in this map, we have current walkability. and. You see, uh, the more purplish, the better it is. The your city becomes more walkable. Uh, and then here is a future walkability, current and future. So this is great. You can do this today. You can uh, other maps that are like this, static or dynamic, where you can. Hit. But can you actually take it one more further? Yes, you can take it one more further. Later. So what I would like to do is actually not highlight the current uh, walkability of the city, but areas that are still are not serviced with, you know, even the. Uh, proposed transit line uh, 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 being added. Uh, the color here in the legend is showing the time that it takes to a particular stop, future or current. Well, so what you can do, if I open up another page where I can do editing, is actually change that uh, stylization dynamically. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to select my future walkability layer or the buildings and I'll be able to symbolize it with other parameters or you can you can you should be able to symbolize it with uh, emphasizing different aspects of your data. 
So in this case, for example, I'll go ahead in options and say, well, actually, I would like to see areas that are not serviced, even with the new uh, plant route. So meaning I can also change color. And notice that is dynamically changing. I change color and values. Uh, and make it a little bit more dramatic. We can go with uh, reddish uh, selection, something like this, and inverse ramp here. And what we want to show is areas that are not that are not served by even the new uh, proposed lines um, and uh, areas that would take actually maybe I should choose a little bit uh, brighter ramp where uh, you'd be able to see the difference um, so dynamically the legend is updating the map is updating and you know the ones that are shown here at yellow are areas that are that would still take over 15 minutes to walk to a particular stop so you are able to change your map immediately without really having to post process or change uh, any of the information, but being able to do this and share that content to, 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 to your users. Um, of course, if you don't commit that information, it's not gonna be saved and uh, will not be uh, uh, persisted. Uh, but this could also be, you know, what we were looking at were, uh, we were looking at uh, untexture un buildings, but you know, there's no rule that says the, those buildings cannot be photorealistic or, uh, uh, you know, texture buildings. Uh, this is, again, the city of San Francisco with over 100,000 buildings, each within, uh, with a multi-LOD uh, structure uh, that are uh, responding see as I zoom out, and they're appropriately with, with both geometry and texture is rendering and being visualized. Um, and then lastly, I want to show you real quick, is if I switch to four, that it is across the platform, and you should be able to see it both on mobile, online, as well as a native application, as long as this, oh, okay, good. So first thing, uh, let's try and see if we can pull up, actually, let me just open up a new tab and show you. Just the same, one of the same maps, oops, not incognito. One of the same maps that we have. Bookmarks, let's just do Orlando maybe. All right, <laughs> this is the last one, I'm done. So the same map, the same experience that we've seen uh, is here, uh, and the same experience could be actually achieved both on uh, online uh, as well as uh, mobile. Uh, and then lastly, uh, there's also a native app. Okay, okay, that would be my cue. Uh, so here's a native application uh, that actually consumes uh, the same 3D service that we've been looking at. Uh, this is a native app sample application that we provide. Anybody can actually download and use it and be able to actually navigate in 3D. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You can take your time. I'm just trying to say this thing's going to come back. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. We have a challenge. I don't know if you heard that music in the background. We got them to turn it off, and all of a sudden they're coming back, so I just didn't want him to be caught with this blaring music. Uh, if you guys hear it, you'll see you can't hear anything. I hope everybody had a good time today. Um, and that you all enjoyed it. Um, didn't everybody do really great? Yeah. Yes, sir. I can't hear a word. Sure, you can come on up and try to show a four minute video. Wait a minute, he's got to. Oh, yeah, but we have a problem because he's streaming. Yeah, you better turn off the stream. You don't have permission to stream. We're streaming this thing. Okay. No, 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 no. You don't know what we're saying to you. Um, come, come right on up. Yes. Uh, do we have any questions here? Yes. Yes, sir. So this is a question for all the speakers. Um, you know, there's. I've been seeing a lot of um, bridging talks between 3D applications and endpoints like Unity or Unreal. And so um, what are the connections between some of the streaming data and the game engines? And can, can you talk to the workflow challenges that you see uh, and, and the tools that you might ha uh, be coming up with in the future to bridge the gap between those workflow endpoints? Maybe uh, on our part, um, 
so I, I just we uh, announced earlier that uh, we're adding uh, capability to be able to directly actually export out from City Engine. Uh, uh, right now, you can do it through FPX, but there's a limitation, and that is what we're trying to do. You know, overcome those limitations. Um, so, in that world, at least, uh, folks would be interested in actually representing the data as it is in the gaming engine. And we also want it in, in the GIS world. Uh, don't get me wrong; that people in the GIS world also want very realistic scenes and uh, environments. Uh, so it's just a balance that we have to achieve, uh, at least. No, the question was, why did we choose Unreal over uh, Unity, for example? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, do you want to say? So, here's... Um, Simon, a City Engine developer. So, we, there's really no preference from our side. So we support both of them equally. Um, uh, um, you, you can use FPX to, to go to both of them. Um, now, Epic chose to uh, go a step further at this point and announced their uh, Datasmith API. So, but there is no no reason you cannot do the same with Unity at this point. We get Caesar Yeah. So on on the Cesium side, I mean, we're seeing GLTF get pretty pretty widely adopted, which is which is helping with with a lot of the interop. But on the bigger streaming streaming data. Uh, NASA is looking at putting 3D tiles in Unity, so I think that will be that will be fantastic. Uh, you know, it's still like a very emerging ecosystem, right? So this time next year, I think we'll have a more uh, more complete story. We're gonna try something. Yeah, with with regard to the game engines and the data and the X and the three D, from our point of view at the Web three D Consortium, um, we're big on metadata. We're big on understanding how um, the X three D platform, that the file format itself, can be supported. You know, either as uh, a, a transformation format between A and B, uh, or as a background back, backbone piece that says, "Hey, we're uh, this is what it is on desktop render." Uh, we need to review that in uh, web collaboration, uh, but I want it to be the same stuff, and I don't want it to be uh, that it's a completely different file format.